As far I know as you I like know, to harp on like an individual term and all of that because you think, oh, oh, I'm gonna get him pinned, but I'm speaking no. very clearly. I think everybody can understand that I'm doing that, but you're just playing dumb. No, oh. I'm not playing dumb. You say you you definitely investigators. Are. It's interesting, actually. When I think of how Sam debates, it's actually pretty similar to Vol. How would you stigmatize? Oh, I would. More? I would stop treating like them like they're Aladdin, like your co-host does, where they're just like thieves with a heart of gold. Uh, I would. <laughs> I would. So you think that there's thieves out there that Emma's, you know, walking amongst, and uh, they're all like. That Emma's yeah, walking Emma. amongst? No, I would never say that. I would never think she would actually. I'm sure you have people on your staff that have said it's no big deal. Or my favorite one where it's like wage theft actually is more than the, the retail theft, you know, why as is if that, wage theft isn't spread them? out over the entire uh -oh, economy. As trigger. if that has anything to do with what we're talking about in the first but place. Wait a second. What is the issue you have in terms of me downplaying the significant increase in crime in New York City and nationwide since 2020? Characterize how you perceive my, uh, how I've downplayed that. I've heard this point from Emma and specifically from you on your show in response to the recent uptick in crime, that crime is not as bad as the 1990s, which is true, by the way. Compared to the peak of America, we're significantly down from that mark. However, we've had a giant increase in crime since the Black Lives Matter riots. You can actually trace it in a lot of places to the month of the riots where we had certain criminal justice reforms implemented that I believe are really driving the uptick in crime. So nationwide, we had a 30% year over year increase in the homicide rate. This is the largest increase in American history. I do think, well, just a guide for stats, I'd be very, very, very careful about largest year over year increases without also taking into account the averages and the absolute um, changes like as well. Um, just as like a quick data point, uh, like so for instance, we could imagine a world where crime looks like this is one data point, this is a data point, this is a data point, this is a data point. Some big event happens and it causes the crime to drop, say COVID-19. And then um, perhaps we get this, 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 or whatever, say this is our trend, right? It might be the case that we can make accurately a statement here saying that this is the largest increase in crime as a percentage for year over year as in the history of all of America. But like taken as a trend compared to like the averages of crime, like the averages could still be decreasing. We might still be lower in crime than we were before. Like I'm just saying that year over year can be tricky. So be careful when you talk about like just using year over year numbers. And I don't know if Sean has taken that into account or not. He Maybe he has. But um, yeah, I would just say always be careful of that. Was actually ahead of that curve. They increased 47% year over year. And to get into the raw numbers for New York City, it went from about 312 homicides. We were in and around 300, and 300 murders in the city of New York per year to 489. I think that's a significant increase. I think the argument that it's not as bad as it ever has been is a terrible argument. And I've heard Homicides, New York, historical. We'll do murder and non-negligible manslaughter. So in 2000, we're at 670, 640, 580, 590, 570, 530, 590, 490, 523, 471, 536, 515, 419, 335, 333, 352, 335, 292, 295, and 319. This was all before COVID. That's a pretty impressive, a pretty steep decline. And then it seems like um, 2020, we go up to 468, and then 488, and then 2022 down to 438. So this might have been an insane increase here, but compared to like even 2010 and onwards, it doesn't seem to be that bad. But wake up in the morning, I got murder on my mind. What does that mean? Hold on one sec. Hold on. Can't see shit on the right? <laughs> Nobody on the right can see shit. <laughs> During 2020 and 2021, we had a once in a lifetime pandemic. But from your perspective, because of the Black Lives Matter protests, we had police reforms that created this spike. We would have to believe those reforms have been reversed this year for the things for the crime to go down. Now, I, I'm going to take issue with even the fact that there were police reforms that caused this. So now that since we've, and, and we should say, this is a nationwide trend. It's not just New York City. True, but the homicide spike was ahead of the nationwide curve in the city of New York. 
and we can right. not we can talk about other cities like Philadelphia is a good example. They're actually at their peak homicide rate all time. So there it actually is worse than the 1990s. Jesus, Philadelphia, what are you doing? This only goes back to 2007, but they look pretty high. 50% George Floyd effect in 50% pandemic? No, right? It's more. Uh, I would say a, a good portion. I don't know if it's specifically like 50% if there's a hard number, but if you want to say, I don't know, 50 to 60%, I think that's totally fine because there were some reforms that were instituted prior that combined with reforms afterwards probably made individual areas worse. So in New York City, we had raised the age, which was actually passed before prior to George Floyd. And year over year, we actually saw and raise the age, if you don't know, actually makes it more difficult to prosecute youthful offenders in the city of New York. And when was it instituted, I guess, is really what I meant. I believe it was instituted in 2018. But your whole argument is, I mean, you pegged it literally to the month. The yeah, for shootings, increase. for sure. If you want to talk about what caused the increase in shootings, in my opinion, removing the I, anti- I'm just going by what you said. And when you said there was this big spike in crime in 2020, yeah, I, well, you said you it listened, was because I, of the George Floyd listened, I thing. I just said that there were some reforms that were passed prior to and combined with new reforms, I think created additional problems. Raise the age made it more difficult to prosecute youthful offenders. Now we had bail reform, which actually came into law in 2020, which made it more difficult to hold people on certain charges, including gun possession. When combined with raise the age, that led to a spike of youthful offenders carrying guns. However, this didn't really come to fruition until Bill de Blasio got rid of the anti-crime unit, which was the unit designed specifically to target illegal guns. So it's a confluence of factors. Regarding the deployment of precinct level and PSA level anti-crime units. These are the plainclothes units that operate our traditional anti-crime. Effective immediately, we will be transitioning those units, roughly 600 people citywide, into a variety of assignments, including Detective Bureau, Neighborhood Policing, and other assignments. For Say. nationwide, one of the biggest factors, I think, driving crime across the nation would be the decrease in the police force. So we had a lot of officers retire early. This is something that we're seeing across the country and a decrease in recruitment because they're not pulling the numbers that they actually want to see. OK, I just I feel like rather this this is so messy. I feel like. Sean, I feel like should have just laid out his entire thesis and then they should move point by point because I'm still not. I guess Sean is trying to make an argument that some policies are increasing criminality, but I feel like they've gone through this so piece by piece that we didn't we haven't even gotten like a full thesis from either one. Um, this is just kind of sloppily, uh, not to blame, I guess, either one. I guess it's just different argumentative styles, but. This is a report from uh, January 31st of this year. Okay. Bloomberg News analysis shows that even as staffing levels dropped during the pandemic nationally, police department headcounts exceeded those of 15 years ago when crime was higher. In major city, cities, staffing levels rose and fell over that period with some changes corresponding to economic downturns and local crises, which you'd imagine. Uh, but between 2011 and 2019, police staffing levels in more than half of the 20 largest cities grew, according to FBI data and across the country. So if we're to use your standard of like, don't compare crime rates today to the way that they were when crime was really high in the country, then why are you doing that with staffing levels? Well, you can compare it to the peak if you want, but if we're talking about a recent crime spike, I don't think that's useful. On top of that, you just read, maybe you didn't realize it, that, that officers went up between 2011 and 2019. This would be before the pandemic, and crime he didn't was dropping realize. nationwide during that period of time. Then we see an officer shortfall, and to be clear, what we're experiencing now we're is still a lot of staff. We still have more. Sure, but uh, we still have okay, more. Not, not police all than we officers did are equal. If you look at ago. who's retiring, it's disproportionately older, seasoned investigators, and they are not so easily replaced by new recruiting classes. And so that's why we're not solving crimes. Is that what you're saying? It's not preventing crime. Investigators don't prevent crime, right? They solve crimes. I mean, they're not only investigators. A lot of times, either. I'm sorry. I'm just going by what unit. you said. You said investigators, and that's why yeah, the crime. A lot of them are you seasoned investigators or seasoned, seasoned investigators. Not okay, I'm easily just replaced. understand. You know this stuff better than I do. I'm just trying to understand your logic. 
you say seasoned investigators is why crime went yeah, up because they're one better. Example. And and I as far I know as you I like know, to harp on like an individual term and all that because you think, oh, oh. I'm going to get him pinned. But I'm speaking no. very clearly. I think everybody can understand that I'm doing that. But you're just playing dumb. No, oh. I'm not playing dumb. You say you seasoned definitely investigators, are. and I say, well, wait a second. They don't prevent crime. They solve crimes. Is that, am I wrong? It would also be supervisor positions and all that. Yes. So it would be very like savvy, seasoned officers and investigators. What reforms were a function of the George Floyd protests that got seasoned investigators to retire? Well, it's not a specific reform, but the effect of driving these officers into retirement is undeniable. Just look at the numbers since the George Floyd riots. Well, uh, it's also COVID, right? No. A they're lot of people retiring. retired across. I mean, a lot still, of people. They're still retiring at similar rates. You think they're all afraid of COVID because of the George Floyd protests? People are very anti police officers. A lot of them had their funding cut, and a lot of officers left when the funding was cut, and they're not so easily replaced oh, by a restoration. So, and funding. your argument is that uh, funding has been cut. Is that it? Yeah, funding <laughs> was cut in certain places, yes. I've got a story here from ABC7 New York. Despite defunding claims, police funding has increased in many cities, and this was in October of last year. Post the George Floyd riots, you had a defund the police movement, and cuts were made to budgets, like, for example, the LAPD. Now, their budget was cut. A bunch of officers left the force, like I said, net 6%, possibly 8%. Again, the numbers update monthly. And then you have officers to supplement for that working overtime. And now you're less productive when you're working overtime. But if you look at the LAPD's budget, it says defunding. And there's stories about this, how defunding the police actually led to an increase in payout of overtime. So you still have less officers working and now they're working more hours. So more you're actually getting poor, investigators. You're, you're right? also getting poor results. Well, again, it's also driving down recruitment. So, yes, less officers, less overall staff. I mean, we have the staffing levels are returning, correct? No, they're not. They're not. Is that right? The spending is returning, but the spending does not make officers materialize. Why do people cite the news organization at the polling such data gathering source is so annoying? I'm not entirely sure. And again, there's a difference between an officer that is a veteran of the force versus a new recruit. I mean, I just read the NPR thing that said the clearance rate is at historic lows. Now, again, that's according to NPR. Initially, I was looking at the FBI stats. They could be pulling from a different number and therefore it could be less reliable. So I will. Sam I sounds like he's drowning here. Not sure I've heard him flounder around so much before. I feel like AJ is the one that's having trouble, like getting his numbers in a row. When every number he pulls up agrees with him and disagrees with Sam, what do you mean by that? Well, it sounds like what Sam is pointing out is that it's hard to say that the increase or decrease has to do with personnel or whatever, but I, I don't know. Uh, you don't blame the mass retirements that we saw across the board on George Floyd, like in other professions, like in teaching professions, for instance. There's an overall increase in retirements in the country because we have a bunch of baby boomers retiring, for sure, that exists. But officers are typically younger, and there's a lot more early retirements. Then teachers, I think you, you'll find that with teachers, uh, people are retiring before they're actual, they're leaving the profession. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, retirement may not be the right word. They're going to go on and work other places. But you don't attribute that to the George Floyd effect. Um, unlikely. And the same across the board with, like, all the great resignation that we heard. Do you remember that term? Yeah, I mean, that's typically young people not wanting to work. It was at peak when unemployment was paying. Actually, it wasn't amount. that they didn't want to work. It's that they were quitting jobs. They didn't want to work they their didn't. specific job. And, yeah, and they went on to different jobs. You're ignoring the the pandemic as uh, an effect, although the pandemic has this effect Destiny. everywhere else. In one sentence, else. how do I convince no, I think, I think the, the pandemic the plays a role. Which means that the Democratic Party sure, are not all socialists and that Trump is a fascist. Maybe earlier in the pandemic when things were starting to lock down, like that's in one sentence, how do I convince my Cuban parents to fear the communist argument that the Democratic Party are not also in Trump? In one sentence, you probably can't convince them. But arguing whether or not somebody's a fascist against a conservative, again, I don't even think that's necessarily a good strategy. Because again, most conservatives, if you describe fascism in other terms, I think most conservatives would actually be like pretty chill with the concept of fascism. Um, I think people just don't like it because it's like a boogeyman word. But like explaining fascism without using the word fascism, I think most conservatives are like, yeah, you know what, actually, this sounds kind of like based. Please give us your definition of fascism. It's kind of vague. 
I mean, fascism is a little bit of a nebulous concept. It's not like there's like a form of government where it's like, oh, we are a fascist regime, right? But broadly speaking, I think there's two tenets that make up a fascist. I've explained this before. Also, it's pretty clear. I guess when you're a conservative and you just don't like my definition because it does map onto Trump and that makes you upset. Usually, it's some form of ultranationalist. So the country's the best. We need to make the country better. It's, that's usually combined with some form of xenophobia. Outsiders are the enemy. We need to be isolationist. We need to build our own stuff. We need to be an, um, an autarky, meaning all of our stuff needs to be manufactured here. Globalization is evil, right? So some form of like ultra-nationalist. Sometimes there could be racism baked into that. It's kind of hard to do that in the United States, but people try. Um, and then authoritarianism. So oftentimes it's going to be like one person who thinks that they need to supersede rule of law. So things like drain the swamp. Things like the media is the enemy of the people. Things like all of our intelligence agencies are rigged against me. Things like I need to overrule the outcome of the election. Things like Democrats and the opposing political party are trying to rig the election against me. Things like we're going to lock up our political opponents, lock up Hillary Clinton, right? Th this is like ultra-nationalist authoritarianism is are kind of like the two big pillars of fascism. That's a pretty clear-cut definition, and Trump very obviously meets both. If you feel like it's too vague or you don't understand, usually it's just because you're a conservative and you're uncomfortable with how closely Trump maps onto that. <clears throat> staffed up how is crime dropping if there is a causal effect in terms of numbers of police why did it go up in 2020 and go up in 2021 when does nationalism become ultra nationalism when love for your country is necessitated by hatred for other countries go up Steven, in 2022 i really really, really, really want to be unbanned from the discord i promise i'll be a good girl this time Echimoko. No clue who you are, or how you got banned, or what happened, but good luck. I believe in you, buddy. Dropping, despite the fact that we haven't hired all these police back. So in the preliminary numbers for 2023, we've seen a slight decrease. Is that what you're trying to hang your hat on right now? Yeah, I'm saying that we know that the trend is going down, and you're making a causality. A, I mean, making, it's still up you're, in comparison to 2019. I understand, but the staffing isn't back up. Well, you're saying the you're trend making, is going Sean, down. You're looking at you are you're looking at the least reliable numbers causality. that you can grasp onto to say Sean, it's going down. Let me ask you this, okay? I turn on the air conditioning in here. Let's pretend our air conditioner works, and I turn the air conditioning unit on. I turn it to 66. Let's say. And the temperature starts to drop in here. And so I say, hey, that is why the temperature is dropping, because I turned the air conditioner on. And then the, the next day, the temperature keeps dropping because I had the air conditioning on. But the third day, the temperature starts to rise. And the air conditioner is still exactly where it was before. Does that make sense that the air conditioner is the cause of the temperature dropping? That the air conditioner caused the temperature dropping? Yeah, uh, yeah because if it goes the up, if the temperature that. goes up on day three and the air conditioner is doing the exact same thing it was doing before, how is it possible that I can make it's a probably causality the external argument? external temperature. Like, I don't, what, what's the point of this? Uh, oh, it could be the external temperature and that maybe the air conditioner hasn't been working at all. And maybe those first two days it was actually cooler. And on the third day it was actually warmer. And that's what's going on. So you're saying Almost the, as if like COVID was acting on on. Well, again, Sam, crime. you keep trying to hang your hat on COVID nineteen. I didn't say COVID nineteen played no role. I said exactly the opposite. But I think no, that no, a I'm lot hanging of my hat as it were a role. on this once in a lifetime pandemic that has caused increase in uh, in destruction of of all sorts of sort of elements of society. And you're making a different argument that that had less of an impact. And I'm asking you, if you're making a causality argument about these reforms that supposedly took place in the wake of the George Floyd protests or the effect that it caused the staffing, yeah. then how come it's reversing itself without any of those changes that well, first it's, caused? Again, it's not reversing itself. You're overplaying your hand. It's it a is reversing in itself. Of it's going but in if, the opposite if, direction. No, it's that not, is the very definition fine, of what, what reversing itself. What we could do is actually look at the city of New Orleans, because I happen to know that New Orleans cut their police funding well before the rest of the nation. Now, this had nothing to do with the George Floyd protests or anything like that. This had to do with budget uh, implications. And for the years, I believe, preceding 2016, they froze their budget up until around 2019, where they actually cut their budget. 
Now, all the experts and nerds say that the New Orleans PD needs about 1,100 officers in order to maintain order. Now, they were at around 1,200 before these budgetary maneuvers ended up going into effect. And now they're in the high 900s. And they saw a crime increase from prior to the pandemic. And they went from a city that was in the top 10 most violent cities to on pace last year for around the number one or number two slot. I have not looked into exactly where they ended up. So they had a dramatic increase in crime that preceded the pandemic due in large part to the fact that they cut their officers, 911 response times went up and all of these other issues associated with that. So we have a beta test that we can look at a specific city in the United States that implemented these policies before the pandemic if you wanna go into that. Well, uh, let's look at let's look at a broader sample than just uh, New Orleans. Well, hold up. In econ, probably in crime as well, you you explicitly look for small cities to pilot a policy like this first, so you can measure it against national averages to see if these particular policies are having an effect. You'd find comparable cities and then measure it against other cities. I don't know why we would completely ignore that New Orleans example there. Um, that seems a little bit weird. In 2016, uh, we had a uh, group of criminologists who did a systemic review of 62 earlier studies. You're aware of this, right? Um, of this specific thing you're bringing up right now? No. They were between, it was a force size, police force size between, of crime between 1971 and 2013. They Why do we dip to a totally different thing, but? Included that 40 years of studies consistently show that, quote, the overall effect size for police force size on crime is negative, small, and not statistically significant. Is that true? Effect of police force on crime. I have I've heard the opposite of that a ton. I'm so curious what study he cited. This is the John Locke Foundation. Who are they citing? Using terror alert levels to estimate the effect of police on crime. Uh, this is in the Journal of Law and Economics. This was published in 2005. Changes in the terror alert levels set by the Department of Homeland Security provide a shock to police presence in Washington, D.C. Using daily crime data during the period, terror alert systems have been in place to show that the level of crime decreased significantly, both statistically and economically, during high alert periods. The decrease in the level of crime, especially large in the National Mall, this provides strong evidence. Okay, this is just one thing. Um, when you add more police to say, oh, this is NPR, so if this was ever going to be biased towards the left, it would be the NPR. Someone write up a megaphone. He's not your guy. They sort of stands apart in the tangle line. If you want to be scientifically objective as possible, Williams and his colleague Aaron Shafflin, Benjamin Hanson, uh, got motivated to answer the question. What is the measurable value of adding a new police officer to patrol a city? Do additional officers commit homicides? How do people, how many people do these officers arrest them for what? Blah, blah, blah. They got the data from the FBI and other public data sources. Is this the study that he was citing, maybe? For 242 cities between the years 1981 and 2018, they obtained figures on police employment, homicide rates, or photo crime, and they find technically cyber systems to estimate the effect of expanding the police size, the impact of more officer. Williams and his colleagues find adding a new police officer to a city prevents between 0.06 and 0.1 homicides, which means that the average city would need to hire between 10 and 17 new police officers to save one life per year. That estimates, they estimate that costs taxpayers annually between 1.3 and, and 2.2 million. The federal government puts the value of a statistical life at around 10 million. So Williams says, from that perspective, investing in one more police officer and more police officers to save lives provides a pretty good bang for the buck. Just as a, a meta drop for this, I've always heard that despite how we feel about cops, whether we like them or we don't like them, whatever, if you put more cops in an area, you will have less crime. That that My understanding is that's just true. I didn't even know that was debated. So I'm a little bit surprised when, um, when Cedar brings up this idea that more cops does nothing. I've never heard that I've never heard that in my life. So I'm really curious what he's citing here. Um, it was this conclusion from the history of research into the effects of police force size on crime. A historical systemic review published in the, is this the journal? Journal of Experimental Criminology. 
Findings vary, findings vary considerably over time. However, compared to research standards and in comparison to effect size as calculated for police practices and other meta-analyses, the overall effect size per police force size on crime is negative, small, and not statistically significant. Changes in research methods and units of analysis cannot account for fluctuations in findings. Finally, there is extremely little variation in police force size per capita over time, making it difficult to estimate the relationship with reliability. Conclusions, this line of research has exhausted its utility, changing police strategies like it have a greater impact on crime than adding more police. Okay, so this is just saying that like, it seems like having more police probably helps a little bit, but like, the number is not even statistically significant. We can't even, I guess, like reject a null hypothesis with this. And research makes it hard because it seems like we've generally had the same number of police force per capita over time. And so this line of study is not very productive. The hypothesis that increasing police force size is relatively simple. It treats police agencies as a firm with a single homogeneous input labor and sets outcomes to the nice and typical city errors argument. Fix attention uh, back across the soups, following standard economic theory. Historical examples provide evidence. Should the number of cops be controlled for? More cops likely to correlate with higher levels of enforcement and crimes being caught. Yeah, but they also will measure like unsolved crimes in a city as well, or like reported crimes. Hmm. I wonder what the difference is. If we'd have to like dig into the actual research. Even more, Williams and his co-authors find that in the average, larger police forces result in black lives saved at about twice the rate of white lives saved. When you consider African Americans more likely to die in dense poverty-stricken areas with high homicide rates, leading to more opportunities Why for Why does your offices. definition of fascism matches one-to-one -one with what communist Castro did it in Cuba in 1959? Um, probably because there might be some overlap, but also I don't, um, do you think I'm gonna defend communism? I mean, like, you, like, doesn't Russia market itself as a communist state? Or no, they probably don't anymore. That's not true. But I mean, like Russia probably maps on to like Putin and his regime probably map on roughly to like a fascist regime as well. Huh. Is this a meta-analysis or is this a review? Conclusions from the history of research. Oh, we can, oh, it's a systematic review of 62 studies and 229 findings of police force size and crime. Hmm. Oh, it says a historical systematic review. I wonder if there's been a response to this or if anybody else has analyzed it. I think he probably just wants a definition of fascism that is exclusionary of communism, probably needs to include a third pillar about business and free enterprise where the state does sanction and profit, but there's no joint ownership of business. Isn't there kind of joint ownership of business though? Like under the, um, like in Nazism, didn't the state dictate to private businesses like things they need to manufacture? Didn't Mussolini do that in Italy as well? I'd have to go back and check for economic organization. I, I don't remember 100%. But I thought that Hitler, I thought that in Germany, I thought that the state was dictating to like private firms, like you need to manufacture, you have to do this or we're shutting you down or whatever. They might not own the business, but it's essentially state controlled. But um, I, I, would have to, I would have to check more, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I mean, that's that runs contrary to your theory, right? That yeah, it's uh, not police just, it's force not size just raw numbers. It's how you utilize them. For instance, New Jersey had their police. I believe it was the uh, the Trenton police, 
and their union had negotiated a deal that was so absurd that they could only put 12 officers out on the street and in a, any given night. They actually had to dismantle this. This was cited by John Oliver as an example of defunding the police, reincorporate as the Trenton Metro Police Department so they could put more officers out on the street. And we've known since the Kansas City experiment, and you can look this up, that sending officers to a targeted way can dis disrupt, disperse, and drive down crime rates. So yeah, obviously it's how you use them. If you just have more employees, remember a lot of these places have non-officer employees. They have administration staff and all that. That's not going to have an impact. And there are other policies that you can implement that also play a role. Um, okay, I, I mean, uh, you have these specific things about different cities, but you can't explain the national trends in any- well, That's such an unbelievably dumb statement by Cedar. Um, politically, he should be aware of this as well. If we're really trying to break down and study a particular thing, we're, we're going to need to dig into individual cities that might implement a policy ahead or behind. Um, just looking at a national trend might not necessarily give you the answer. Anyway. Uh, nationally, before you cut me off way earlier, I was going to talk about the First Step Act. Now, this set a tone in the nation. It was signed by Donald Trump, the evil orange man. It's one of his stupider policies. And it sets up incentives and, of course, any change in culture federally tends to trickle down nationwide for to for people to go soft on youthful offenders, to release nonviolent offenders early, which is a term I absolutely hate because nonviolent criminals can be more devastating than any given murderer, depending on the circumstances. I always like to say Bernie Madoff never punched anybody in the face, but he ruined more lives than most serial killers in the United States of America with his financial crimes. So, yeah, I don't agree with that policy, which was a nationwide policy. And I believe the First Step Act may have been slightly before uh, Floyd. I don't remember the exact date, but I have a feeling it was after when it was signed by Trump. What's that? the the George what? The First Step Act? When when did that when when did when did, you don't know when that took? I, I can look it up right quick. But but Sean, how can you posit to me that this had an impact? And it all happened, and you don't even know when it was implemented. Well, First Step Act was 2017? I don't remember. Hold on. 2018. Because this was during Trump's um, presidency. Uh, but I don't know how relevant this is. I mean, he's going to know within like a couple year time span, but... Well, I said it's in and around that time. I don't remember exactly when it was passed. It could have been in and around that time. We all know that uh, this guy... Uh, Kiesa Boudin, right, in uh, Chase uh, Boudin in, in uh, San Francisco was one of these reformists, right? Yes. What do you make about um, what do you make about the, uh, the, the rise in crime in San Francisco since he was replaced by the uh, police union's um, uh, choice? The new district attorney? Yeah. Well, there are some state laws in California that they have to get around. Like one of the stories that I covered recently was a man that was arrested for 77 burglaries, or I'm sorry, convicted. Are, those, are these new laws since uh, uh, Chase Aboudin has been uh, I believe ousted? That, I believe that they are, yes. So You believe um, that they, they are? What laws are they? <laughs> I don't like how Sam is like quizzing him on every little thing now when he refused to engage with any of the particular city data earlier. That's a little bit bullshit, but okay. I forgot. I, I don't know the name of it, but in California, if you're a nonviolent offender, they don't. If you're categorized as a nonviolent offender, they actually don't put you in prison. You have to go to county jail. But county did, jails are. Did, I feel like as I'm listening to this, not to be mean or rude or whatever, but like it feels like it feels like Sam does come at this from a very debate bro perspective. Like he's not really trying to like earnestly engage or like with any level of curiosity, like dig through anything that Sean is saying. He's just kind of like. Basically, he's trying to like Vosh trap him on like every single little point. Did, did we over. see similar rises in crime in LA and San uh, yeah, Diego? Yeah, we, we actually saw we actually saw a, a dramatic increase in murder in LA as well. Since since the time that Kiesa Boudin left office, since Chesa, well, I'm talking about since 2020. I didn't realize that's what you were specifically asking. Well, but. I mean, because Chesa Boudin is oh, an avatar, uh, and and he left in uh, a year ago. He is an avatar for the reformists. He leaves and then crime pops up across like four or five different measures. Which categories are you referring to? In San Francisco, violent crimes. Vehicle yeah. theft, 2.5. Uh, Homicide, 23%. Robbery, 13%. 
yeah, there are other problems and other factors for sure. And again, when Chesa Budin was in office, he fired, and I believe it's called- That's he's ducking Nick? Wait, what? A Friday Night Massacre or something like that. He fired a bunch of seasoned district attorneys or assistant district attorneys in his office. Like, you know that happened, right? And again, you know those people took other jobs. And again, you know they don't just materialize out of thin air when they replace the prosecutor. Right. Like, yeah, so there are impacts that go beyond that. I mean, if we were talking about any piece of legislation, like, you know, you, you talk often about the impact that Ronald Reagan had on this country. Well, if I said, well, Bill Clinton was president in the 90s, therefore that Ronald Reagan impact doesn't exist, you would not accept that argument. But weirdly, you're trying to put that forward right now for me. Well, I mean, for you, the impact happened in June of 2020, right around yes. the time of the riot. Well, not for me, for the statistics, the, that's the, actually when it started to spike. Right. So and by you, the data, uh, that, you, would, that would be and, accurate. And just the moment that people started protesting with George Floyd, crime goes up because of its downstream implications. Like, time flattens and expands for you in yeah, terms of the way this causality afraid, works. Officers are afraid to do their jobs because they feel like they're being, they're gonna get prosecuted unwarrantedly. And you know, like, officers that do commit crimes should be prosecuted, to make that clear. Then, yeah, that, that could have impacts if officers are leaving the force at record numbers, if early retirements are up and you're losing your most seasoned people, investigators or not, Sam, then yes, that would cause an increase in crime. And you're going to ignore the uh, meta-analysis about uh, the the from Police Journal about the uh, this relationship between Journal on Experimental Criminology. I think was the journal, right? Well, I don't know why he just says Police Journal, but okay, probably because he just got somebody that passed this off to him. Uh, well, you said it was a systemic review, and I'm not ignoring it. I don't think just expanding your all systematic review. Or wait, no, was it him that had the problem? Or was it, no, 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 wait. He he probably does know there was, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the one when Lance was on Tim Pool's show. Um, I, pr I call them system reviews. When I was, they're syst wait, are they systematic reviews? No, wait, they are systematic reviews, right? Yeah, they are, okay, sorry. Okay. Officers or your staff in police on its own is any is anything. It's what you do with that. Like one of the great innovations in New York was that they became one of the most data-driven police departments in the entire country. So yeah, they had a lot of officers because it's New York City, it's the largest city in the union, but it wasn't until they implemented programs like Comstat that they really were able to be effective. In my story- Well, certain things COVID, have changed. Eric see, Adams was, re -elect, was elected. My, my, it, well, but this is nationwide. My well, story about, is, okay. my story is COVID contributed to this nationwide spike in crime. Ah, a friend of the stream, Diddley. I think she still posts on the subreddit sometimes. She's a cool person. XQC lost over a million dollars gambling in Vegas. I'm so disappointed in him and his choice to share this publicly sent such a horrible message to all his viewers. He could have hit the jackpot, but instead he gave up. 90% of gamblers quit before they win big. Jesus. Your story is Christ. that the George Floyd protests were yes. the, were the uh, primary function of the drive yes, because crime. During the lockdown, okay. crime no. actually dropped. Okay. The reason why crime is down nationwide, and it is down, you say it's not much, but it is trending down is because that coincides with society returning to some measure of normalcy after COVID is not killing as many people and hospitalizing as many people and causing the same measure of stress. You say the reason why crime is, is dropping a little, but definitely statistically measurable is because I need to wait to the end of the year to see if it's real. No, no, it, the, I'd say it's dropping, but it's like within a, a normal range. It's like if, if, if I were on your show and I said, I don't know, in 2019, homicides in New York were 299 and then they jumped to the number 312. That's an increase, but that's not a significant increase. It's within the range. We're talking about 13 people now, on, you know, obviously those are lives lost and we should consider that. But we also have to take into account that New York is the largest city in the in the world. Now, you're pointing out a similar decrease to that increase and claiming that it's like this dramatic drop, but it's just no, not No, I'm not there. claiming it's a dramatic drop. Well, I'm you're, saying, you're that saying the it's trend dropping, is like explain reversing. this drop. It seems like a normal range that we would see year over year. I hope, it, I hope it would become a trend, but yet, one year is not a trend. Yet the trend is dropping, yet the problem that you attribute the spike to is not changed at all. Well, in, in 
specifically in New York City, which is no, what I was just yeah, referring I'm to. Hold on. Hold on. Specifically <laughs> in New York City, which I was just referring to, we had a situation where they elected the most tough on crime Democrat. Now, I'm not a big fan of Eric Adams, but that is how he ran. And he ran about putting more police off onto the street. We also have nationwide, a lot of these district attorneys like Chesa Boudin. Now, you said crime has gone up in San Francisco. Uh, I don't know. Not I don't, just I, I said, remember. it is. Yeah, I mean, so it sure. has. But it they has. got rid of him, so they're trying to institute some levels of reforms, but obviously San Francisco police, they're down in terms of recruitment. Obviously, California state law, sometimes state law has a dramatic impact on these specific things. Even Again, though it doesn't have it on others. That hold up the house of, of the criminal justice system. So those need to be changed. But yeah, so it depends. There are some reversals. I think those reversals are good. But in places where they're doubling down, like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, they're still at record homicides. And not record in comparison to 2019. Record all time, worse than the 1990s. The favorite talking point of the crime denialist. Crime okay. denialist. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, the, um... Yes, people who deny crime. Yes, that's who I'm talking about. What do you about. mean crime by deny crime? That they'll uh, try pivot. to minimize and deny that the increase is happening. Do what you did with marijuana arrests, where you complain, where you assert that it's possibly due to arresting bias, even though that's not how we measure crime. We measure crime in reports, and then we do victimization surveys, and then we have homicide statistics. We're actually really good at measuring crime. So pointing out arresting bias is a denial. Well, wait a tactic. second. You just said like we're really good at measuring crime, but yes. if you see the statistics are trending down, they're really that's not. I didn't say relevant. I didn't say they're nothing. I said that they're there, but they're within a range that we have now gotten into a new normal. So they're good. I'm always going to root for crime to go down. But what I'm interested in is getting to that all time low way back in time in that far off year of 2019. And I think you have to institute the policies that existed in 2019. We haven't even talked about incarceration. You know that prison population is declining in the United States of America. And that also seems to be tied to the increase in crime. Uh, not in Connecticut. Not in Connecticut in terms of population decreasing or? No, no, not in Connecticut in terms of as uh, their prison uh, population has dropped. So it's interesting that now Sam does want to talk about a specific example. He wants to talk about Connecticut specifically, but anytime before Sean brought up a specific example, Sam wanted to focus on national trends. Dramatically, they have instituted all these reforms and crime is also dropping dramatically in Connecticut. How do you explain that? I would have to look up the crime sets for the state of, for, for Connecticut because you tell me that a well, 4%, here, let me, uh, a 4 decrease after a dramatic increase is a dramatic drop, and that's just not true, but I'll right. look it up. Well, let me uh, let me just uh, uh, pull this up. I have this somewhere here. You can look that up, too. I think it's a pretty well-known story. I'm surprised that you... I anticipated <laughs> that you would know about that one. Jesus, Sam. Um, yeah, I don't know every single state in the union offhand. Okay. I mean, Connecticut's right next door to us. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you think that would matter? <laughs> Violent crime in 2021 uh, down 43 <sighs> percent since really? 2012. A reported crime, mostly burglaries, fell by 29 percent during that period. Uh, but get me that. Uh, get me the. I had. Oh wait, here it is. Sorry. This is uh, from. Uh, oh, this is from yesterday, uh, to, uh, July 27th. Uh, in 1999. Connecticut had so many people in prison, had to send 500 of them to be incarcerated to Virginia. That's uh, part of the story there. Uh, the state's uh, um, uh, rate of 155 people in prison per 100 th uh, st uh, residents is now the ninth lowest in the country, well below the national average of 350 people per 100,000. Uh, violent crime decreased 43% from 2012 to 2021. Property crime sank 29% during the same period. The state unleashed a range of changes. This is under uh, Governor Malloy in 2011. So, I mean, it's a long-term trend. State unleashed okay. a range of changes, including repealing the death penalty, bumping the age at which juveniles Based on drivers in Connecticut, the average citizen is 78 years old. All Connecticut drivers. Jesus. 16 to 18 for most crimes. I think you were against that one in New York. Eliminating uh, yes. some sentencing guidelines that affected predominantly people of color. Um, they have now been able to close, I think, uh, a bunch of prisons. Um, he said, uh, this is Malloy, who's now, I guess, a um, chancellor of the, the University of Maine system. 
Not only had the state uh, built too many prisons, but had a mix of old buildings and new prisons built for maximum punishment instead of facilities where people could be rehabilitated. Uh, in 2016, Malloy, uh, they went to prisons in Germany and they came back and they did this. I, you must, I would imagine you would hate this. Uh, it led to the creation of a true unit at a correctional facility, truthfulness to oneself and others, respectfulness towards the community, understanding and elevating into success. It was all programs uh, to mentor people and uh, they have been sending less people to prison and they have less crime. So why would you think I would hate a rehabilitation program? It just seems super soft. <laughs> no, why I, would he assume that he's... He, <laughs> wow. Wait, he just assumes he's like a tough on crime, like, hey, okay, whatever. First of all, I want to do smart things on crime. I don't want to just be cruel for no reason. If you uh, told me, if you told anybody in this country that you could take a criminal and make them a productive member of society, they would sign up for that easy, like Do you obviously. Think that but the problem is, overly the problem policing is, areas? is that rehabilitation programs have bad data around them. One of the things that I'll actually commend London Breed for over in San Francisco is in a recent emergency crime bill, she actually pushed for you know studying the way that these programs work. Now, in terms of the state of Connecticut, they might have had the crime drop, according to you. I'll take your word for it. But I do want to point out that the report that you're highlighting, a big editor's note in it, is that it glosses over the fact that clearance rates have actually dropped in the state of Connecticut. It was 16.7% going into 2020, and now it's 24.4, sorry, 23.4%. So it's had a dramatic increase in clearance in the unsolved crimes. Okay. So there are problems, but you know, yeah, not like everything has a marginal utility. So just because reducing prison, or just because increasing prison population to a certain point can reduce crime doesn't mean you will continually benefit in crime reductions just by arbitrarily increasing the prison population. We, uh, by, by, by sending more, less people to prison and uh, crime reducing, I don't know if there's a causality there, but it seems to be a long-term trend. You're saying that impacts the clearance rates. No, no, I just said that their clearance rates are up. It's not all rosy. I'm looking at this. The clearance like, rates are down. Well, but, but, well, well, why does it. their, why, why does their, why would that affect their clearance rates? Well, I didn't say, that, well, maybe some of their reforms or losing officers like Nationwide Trends would affect their clearance you, rate. You think that, I didn't that, say decreasing that, the prison population did. You just cited all this positive data from the state of Connecticut. I pull up the report that you're referring to and they're like, listen, there is a caveat. The police are actually less productive in the state of Connecticut, which could be attributed to some, not all the reforms. I'm not saying the prison population reduction necessarily makes officer clearance rate going down. I'm just pointing out that this is happening. Like How this is also happening in the state of Connecticut. How does reducing the number of incarcerated individuals inhibit the, did, did, uh, did I not just say I'm not saying that reducing the Okay, you just brought it up when I was talking about some other We were talking topic, about Connecticut like, overall, um, okay. and you were painting a very rosy picture of the state of Connecticut. I think the crime being down 25% is uh, pretty is a pretty rosy, I'm, even I'm if the clearance rates are not as high. Because I'm very I mean, theoretically, happy about that. there's two reasons why you want higher clearance rates, right? One is presumably because you want to take uh, people off the streets who have committed a crime a, because uh, they've committed a crime, but B, you don't want them to commit a second crime. And yes. uh, B, obviously, for some type of closure for the victims. Uh, but we do see um, significant drops in crime uh, yeah. as we have less incarcerated people and these reforms, well, which you had said you had a problem with. But let's well, I get do, to... I do have a problem let's with Let's get it, to the causes again. of crime. Let's get to the causes of crime. I think we've, we've examined this. Well, uh, your, well Sam, again, I, I, said this mil, of, I said this a million times. Pillars in a building. You can knock down one pillar, but if Connecticut has other things institutionally that are working to reduce crime, then that might not bring down the whole building. So in this instance, but nice saying, uh, pulling out one specific state after coming down on me for doing that yes. about just, cities uh, and all that. It was just an article I found that was in the news two days ago, so that's why it was there. But um, well, let's uh, uh, let's talk about the other thing that you wanted to discuss, and that was uh, the excusing of crime by blaming poverty. Yes. I, now I, I I will admit that I did not um, see this exchange with you and Emma, and I did not ask her. I've never heard her say that I excuse um, 
excuse crime because of poverty. Uh, I, I would suspect that she would argue, at least in part, that crime is a function of poverty, right? Not, not, not you get a get out of jail free if you're poor and you've committed a crime, uh, you live in poverty, but rather that crime is a function of poverty. I would imagine that's what she was saying. And no, specifically when I brought up that 327 people in the city of New York are arrested for a third of the shoplifting arrests in the city of New York, which represents over 6,000 arrests, she said that those people are the most desperate and they're doing it because they need to survive or to to sustain their lives. So, so something in other words, to that, that effect. poverty... So that sounds like an excuse to me. So yes, There's, that would be excusing crime with the poverty excuse. Uh, to me, it sounds like um, an argument as to what is driving crime. But I, I did, I, like I say, I, I'm not familiar well, with I, that. I, I argued, and I'll argue what here. What do you think that the is... fact that we're not able to hold repeat offenders is what is causing that? If you locked up those 327 people, guess what? You have a third of the retail theft arrests gone because how, they keep committing the crime. How many people would you have to lock up to make sure that you got the right 327? Well, it would be the, for that specific issue it would be the 327 that are arrested a grand total of 6,000 times. So it'd be <laughs> the 327. So when would, would be you the when would you lock them up and throw away the key to save from the shoplifting? Uh, well, it's interesting actually. When I think of how Sam debates, it's actually pretty similar to Vosh, to where Sam has a lot of like random background information on stuff, and then he's also like decent at like debate and philosophy. And the goal, rather than actually prepare for a debate with somebody who's knowledge on a topic, he's just trying to find like these kinds of logical pitfalls or these little philosophical traps, basically. Like, can I get him on the data here? So arresting 327 people, well, you couldn't arrest them the first time because then you'd have to arrest like a million people. Would you do the second time, the third time? Like trying to find pitfalls right here rather than like actually having en engaged with the um, with any of the actual data or doing any of the actual research. Well, it wouldn't be it would be charge them seriously, hold them in blue and in, in waiting for their trial and then convict them prosecute them seriously yes but uh, but 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 you're saying if we lock up those 327 essentially yes. and don't let them out we're going to have less shoplifting that's yes. what you're saying right all right now you don't know that's what who, the data says when do you he's going to yeah he's going to say at what shoplifting offense do you arrest them and hopefully hope to god he doesn't say three because then sam's going to do like some three strike law thing or something but we'll see what uh Oh, that it's those 327. The first time they shoplift? No, I mean, if you, I'm talking about repeat offenders, so it would be okay. when they have repeat That's what offenses. I'm asking. How many? So two. Two shoplifting offenses gets you locked up for as well, long as you want. We should them. prosecute shoplifting and retail theft seriously from the jump. The idea that this is a victimless crime is nonsensical. But let's say if you're arrested for five times, which, by the way, again, it's 6,000 spread over 327 people then we don't let you out without bail. Like a judge would be able to have judgment to determine that you are a repeat offender and you are whole, held. You're held uh, in, in like where? Where would we put them in? Like a Rikers or something? In a, in a jail. And there's no uh, there's no dollar figure, right? We just... Uh, well, aren't you against cash bail because, you know, poverty? Yeah, I, I, I am against cash bail. Yeah, so I would want the judges, right now they can't assess dangerousness in the state of New York. I would want them to Are be able to assess. Are shoplifters dangerous? Is I mean, according to you? Yeah, they're repeat offenders, and eventually, a bunch of these people, when confronted, get into physical altercations, and people have been killed over that. I've covered multiple stories of Home Depot workers being killed. We find out that the person behind the theft that led to many, killing that worker was arrested a bunch of times for these so-called petty crimes. You could have got them off the streets, and then somebody dies over it. Some poor person who works, you know, for whatever, $15 an hour at Home Depot gets killed by somebody who wanted a power drill. So yeah, I want those people off the streets, for sure. So what do you think uh, drives crime? He's really good also at not taking any L's ever, right? So Sean, really, and this is easy for me to say in retrospect, but Sean should say, okay, so you agree then at the least, before we go to the next thing, you agree then that we should lock up repeat offenders, or at least deny them cash bail, or at least judge them more harshly after the third, fourth, or fifth offense then, right? Because notice how Sam just walked away from that, now we're moving on to a totally different topic. I'm not, I think this is, maybe this is just more me than anything else. Cause I like to, I like to finish a topic before I move on to the next thing. Um, even if that means taking an L I guess, but I notice a lot of people will easily just skirt to like the next thing. They don't actually care about like finishing a topic at the end at all. They're just like, they'll just like move on. 
what I think drives crime. Yeah. Well, what I think creates I think crime. policy. I think public policy has a big impact. There are people that are opportunistic that will commit crime if they think there are no consequences, whether they be social or whether they be through the criminal justice system. And I've broken this down. You can think of it as a pyramid with three layers. The lowest part of the pyramid is the criminal justice system, the actual consequences. And the reason why this is one of the lowest deterrents is be and by the way, I'm not making this up. This comes from like, you know, criminal justice theory. The reason why this is one of the lowest deterrents. I was is assuming the, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt yeah, that you're not. But making I'm just up I'm the just saying stuff, it's not my but, it's not my theory. But the the deterrence doesn't really work. It's not really that effective because most people, when they commit a crime, don't think they're going to get caught. The right. next stage in that pyramid would be the social consequences. So if people will treat you like a pariah, if you are arrested and convicted of a crime, that is a stronger deterrent against you committing crimes. And then the third, the top of the pyramid, the number one thing is if you believe that the law is moral and or just, that is what's going to prevent you from criminality. Okay, and so um, it, if you live in a society where, like, you, you, everybody lives in uh, around you lives in extreme poverty, uh, do you think that um, numbers? I think, like, was it uh, two and three on your pyramid? I mean, in other words, like, so what would you do if I put you in charge of uh, of, of social policy and you could be you could be king for a day, uh, or you know, a couple of weeks or whatever it is? Uh, what would you do? Would you, what would you do to, to, what do you think the most effective thing we could do to fight? Uh, like you say, there's always going to be some uh, folks who, I don't know, uh, uh, like uh, living on the edge and uh, committing crimes. But, but broadly speaking, what would you do? Uh, how do you mean? Well, what you just uh, you worked out a, a pyramid for us. And so uh, put that into practice, if that's the pyramid that you believe in. Again, like, how do you, how do you mean? What policies? Which like I just told you, what prevents people? Uh, what prevents people from committing crimes? Like, how would I put that into practice? Are you talking about from a law enforcement point of view? It would depend entirely it's easy for me where to use the I boss am. Tactic, I'm lazy, but I still want to fight. It's different depending on the city. It's very much down to the local municipality. So, if I was designing an intervention for New York City, it would be completely different than an intervention for the city of St. Louis or the city of Chicago. So, again, like, what do you mean? Okay, what would you do in uh, in New York City, let's say, to deal with uh, crime? I mean, you're like I've, I, I mean, I guess like when we're looking at the the causes of crime here, and, and you just laid out some type of, uh, of of pyramid, it sounded like you discounted the the punishment one, which was the widest one, right? I mean, yeah, my understanding well, deterrence that, actually, but yeah, yeah, but that doesn't deter you. You don't think that deters because people don't think they're going to get caught. Yeah, a lot of people don't think they're going to get caught. So that's so, why I'm so in favor. So it's not a function of cops in no, no, terms I, of like... No, no, you, you misunderstand. It, yeah. Deterrence is not that effective of a strategy from a law enforcement level, but that doesn't mean incapacitation is not an effective strategy. So incapacitation so up more would, be, people. would be removing repeat offenders. And, and, and so uh, locking up more people, but how would you get there, I guess, is what you're talking about. Uh, the first Jesus. thing I would do in the state of New York, because again, it is dependent on the area, is that I would get rid of bail reform law and allow judges to have judgment. I think it's ridiculous the way we operate in the city of New York. If we're concerned about people that are poor that can't afford their bail for lower crimes, I understand that. I would reduce the bail amounts. But what I need is for the judges to be able to assess dangerousness. Dangerousness. So you're only talking violent crimes. Well, um, or repeat offenders, repeat, you know, yeah. like the original bail reform, and they've amended it to remove certain things. Uh, didn't even factor in bail jumping as a crime that could get you held. So if you didn't show up for court, but now that's changed. When did that change? I, I, that they might have changed that specific portion, but I know they removed. They used to have aggravated vehicular manslaughter as a charge that was not bail eligible, and they did change that. So, like, yeah, there have been some changes to it. They actually update it every year around April when the budget comes in. So I'm not exactly sure which specific crimes, but I want judges to be able to assess repeat offenders. I don't want to be in a position where they cannot hold somebody as long as they commit this crime. And then they're incentivized to recommit the same crime over and over again. But you think that's the most important thing, bail reform? I think bail reform is a huge deal in the state of New York, and it impacts almost every county. I believe when... Um, the governor's race was going on. We had something like uh, 
like 98 percent of counties or 98 out of uh out of like 101 counties i don't remember exactly how many counties so it might have been a percentage that saw an increase in crime so uh you discount the bottom uh part about deterrent on that uh, pyramid what was yeah, the deterrence second? is the lowest and least and one of the <clears throat> least effective yes I don't get why that's on the, uh, but uh, so uh, on the bottom you think is the least effective. Yeah. And then the middle one is, what's the next one? That would be like societal pressure. If you feel like you're going to be an outcast from your community or treated like a pariah, like the social pressure that keeps you in line. How would you increase that social pressure? Well, I think we should do more to stigmatize criminals for sure. Like we, we how, would you doing this. how would you stigmatize? How well, would you stigmatize? Well, I would more? I would stop treating like them like they're Aladdin, like your co-host does, where they're just like thieves with a heart of gold. Uh, I would I would stop <laughs> like sympathizing with them and how sympathize many, with the victims. In the case of shoplifting, we should sympathize with like Walmart or something more. And we should we should sympathize with the community who has to pay for that in higher prices, or the people who lose their jobs because these stores uh, shut down. We should sympathize with these people that have to end, up, down have to of, end uh, up traveling further due to the fact that there's a less grocery stores in their area. Yeah, oh we no. should sympathize with them rather than the opportunistic thieves. Okay, and so um, and so you think that there's thieves out there that Emma's you know walking amongst, and uh, they're all like that. Yeah, Emma's walking Emma. amongst? No, I would never say that. I would never think she would actually. You live think the thieves the are watching the show? Protects. You think the the thieves are watching the show and they're going? It's okay. More no, no, cops are going to retire. A, it's not just the majority report per se, but there's this general dismissive nature towards these retail thieves. Like you can see it on every on every reply in the video. It seems like the whole debate is Sean doing all the work and Sam just poking without putting it in state. Yeah, because I think Sean has done all the research and Sam's just kind of here trying to like find flaws in his argument, basically. Because he doesn't have anything necessarily prepared for this. Yeah. It's like now there's has people that, that are definitely over time? against. Them. Has that changed over time? I think, yes, people have become more sympathetic to people and possibly due to the fact that we have the pandemic. So the excuse is that these people well, wait are a second, struggling. Dude, why was there this huge drop in crime? So in 1990, for instance, let's say, or 87, people were too sympathetic to uh, shoplifters. So, and, and then and in, the, in, in the 90s, later in the 90s, they were less sympathetic to shoplifters. And that's why it went down. Well, no, there is an overall sentiment change. I mean, for you to not acknowledge this is ridiculous. Like, go look at Joe Biden on the floor of the Senate pushing the crime bill and listen to the way Joe Biden talks about crime now. I'm into I want to say high. My point is crime was higher. 1990s then. Joe Biden. Yeah, they're passing a law. 1990s Joe law. Biden was harsher on crime and yes, crime yes. began to drop precipitously. Yes. Crime that started to drop, uh, or drop nationwide after that crime bill. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. And then, and then, <laughs> yeah, that was the uh, point. And then crime shot up. Like when? When did we start as a society? Just in the past two years, have we gotten more sympathetic to to shop? I do think people have become more sympathetic to criminals and less sympathetic to the police. A hundred percent. I I wait, don't wait, know wait. about your is it coverage. About the uh, is it about the police? Or is it about the criminals? I thought it was. Well, we're really talking about, about cultural attitudes related to crime in the criminal justice system. So yeah, okay. when I talk about retail thefts, there's a lot of excuse making. I'm sure you have people on your staff that have said it's no big deal. Or my favorite one, where it's like wage theft actually is more than the the retail theft. You know, why as is if that, wage why theft isn't spread that? out over the entire uh -oh, economy, as trigger. if that has anything to do with what we're talking about in the first well, place. Wait a second. Wait a second. You just said the problem. You just said the problem uh, uh, with um, with shoplifting is what it does to the community. You don't yeah. think you don't think wage theft there is there's something like what what are the numbers that you understand wage theft to be on an annual well, basis? Well, I know that you guys like to use the 2013 chart because it has a very big disparity that comes what from you, the economic policy. What do you policy think institute? the wage well, I mean uh, it's not just the economic policy institute, but what do you what do you put wage theft at? I, I would put it at the tens of billions. I think the number that you guys often cite is around 50 billion, even though what I've you're citing is the billion. wages recovered. But, you no, know, the, the wages recovered, under. wages recovered was to, was was closer to, I think, uh, 20 billion. But the the annual I mean, the estimates I've seen are anywhere from like three to six billion dollars annually because you don't always recover it. I mean, at all. Um, but you think that that loss we recovered would be twenty uh, billion, but the annual twenty not billion total over the course six? of ten years. Um, over the course of ten years. Yeah, 
that's the stat that uh, the DOJ puts out. The um, but the 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 point is is that you, I just want to be clear on this. Shoplifting hurts a community more than people. I didn't say it hurts a community more. It's just a different problem. So what well, you're doing well, is it's crime. So what you guys do is, is I talk crime? about a problem, or someone like me talks about a but wait, problem. Wait, Sean, is that and not then you crime? say, hey, look at don't this other problem. Don't get mad at. Two just address. Makes the who cares? Don't, I guess. Don't, don't don't get mad at. Just address the <laughs> issue. This is wage theft, right? We both agree it's a crime. Yeah, you shouldn't do it, and I'm in favor of well, them recovering illegal. it. Well, it's illegal. It's not just it's it. not it's, yes. it's illegal. Okay, I just said I'm so, in favor of the so, prosecution of it. And in fact, we're talking about the same people too, right? Like, because when you say, "Well, people don't uh, sympathize with a corporation when there is uh, there is shoplifting, and it's going to hurt the workers there and the community because of high prices and presumably, you know." Uh, uh, high prices are going to hurt low-income uh, people more than others. Well, to, to be clear, well, we're I not... I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear what you're saying. Well, we're, we're that, not talking... is, that is... How is that really not hitting the exact same players? Well, Sam, we're not talking about the same people because, again, wage theft is spread out over the entire economy. When we talk about retail theft, that typically... Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. Involves the retail sector. So what you're actually doing is expanding the denominator. Where do you think wage the theft is highest? I would. Oh, Sean just philosophy to point without knowing the exact numbers. That is true. Wage theft is going to be spread out over the entire economy. When Sam says, where is wage theft highest? That's a good question. <clears throat> where is wage theft highest? I feel like my guess is going to be probably for illegal immigrants. Like if you consider that, um, if you consider that um, wage theft, illegal immigrants working for no pay. More than one in 10 construction workers are undocumented immigrants. Non-union construction industry. If anybody has a source for this, I'd be curious to see. Oh, that just said most wage theft came from Southern California. Did I just read that? Okay, so the highest ones are food service, which is 27 million, construction, which is 33 million, and then retail is down here at 7.5 million, healthcare is at 15 million. So retail comes in like fourth, and a relatively distant fourth, it seems. Food service and construction are like four to five times higher. It felt like Sam was about to make the point that retail is the most effective wage theft in industry. Retail theft, that typically, now I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, involves the retail sector. So what you're actually doing Where is do expanding the denominator. Where do you think wage the theft is highest? I would think probably in government contracts, a lot of these have issues with the Davis-Bacon law where they're underpaying. It probably is in major corporations with unpaid overtime. I think it's in a lot of different places, but I do know that a lot of illegal immigrants in the United States of America are in So Sam's team is probably looking it up right now, but if they look up the numbers, retail's not going to come in the top five. Sam looks like he really wants to correct him because he said things he doesn't like, but I wonder if they're going to correct them now that they say that retail's not, that retail's like fifth or fourth entitled to the wages under Davis Bacon, and they often get cheated. And it is a great moment years later, although sometimes their lives are ruined, when investigators find out that they're backdated pay and they give them a huge check. So I would think it happens in multiple different sectors, not just retail, but yeah, and it has multiple different forms. I mean, uh, all right, so uh, you're just keying in on shoplifting. That's Oh, I feel like he saw the numbers. I feel like he's reading them, and he doesn't want to say them out loud now. That's what it feels like, because it feels like he really wanted a big own there where he was going to read the numbers, but now he's not going to say them. Because you know they're looking these up right now. In multiple different sectors, not just retail, but yeah, and it has multiple different forms. I mean, uh, all right, so uh, you're just keying in on shoplifting. That's the crime. The well, when we talk about retail crime. theft, we typically talk about retail theft. No, I understand. You're doing a two wrongs makes a who cares. No, I'm just saying, I'm just, I just find it curious. But that, that's, that's fine. Uh, you were the one who brought up wage theft. I just well, want to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> and now he wants to move off the topic completely. <laughs>
because it's a common retort by people who are trying to deflect don't get off so the meta. issue. Then we won't get hung up on these things. It's also, um, you know, so, nobody talks about stealing from your employer, which many years is actually higher than wage theft. But, you know, there's that too. True! And fuck yeah, yeah. You better believe if I work food service, you better believe I'm eating. <laughs> oh, sorry. We had to toss that cheeseburger out. That patty was no good because I'm going to be eating it hell yeah i'm eating all those chicken nuggets oh what's that i'm sorry is it lunchtime did i accidentally drop an extra 14 mick griddles ha, looks like we have to waste that and by waste it i'm gonna be eating all that shit hell yeah fuck you mcdonald's i will eat these extra mick griddles mm. ah feels good Okay. Um, uh, I yeah. I don't. Uh, I, I I guess nobody talks about that. It's not on the charts that you present from the Economic Policy Institute. I, I mean, I, dude, you brought up wage theft. Yeah, because it's a common retort, and I've seen it brought up on your show. Well, yeah, wage theft is an issue. Um, I never said we've it wasn't. We've also brought up, uh, you know, that. Uh, <laughs> Does it, uh, this is a pretty. This is kind of gross from Sam. Uh, corporations lie about how much they're getting, um, uh, how much they're uh, they're they're suffering from um, from uh, uh, from you know uh, petty theft. I mean, uh, Walmart, I think, executive admitted Try that on a call with uh, financiers. They blow it up. So you're talking about a Walgreens executive where yeah. he said, or she, I don't remember. I think it might have been a woman that it was uh, that we may have overstated this in this specific Walgreens call. But I do remember when Walgreens got into it with London Breed, who claimed that it was completely overstated and they clarified about four times that they closed due to the increase in theft specifically in San Francisco. And honestly, it should be it should be alarming that these stores are closing in left wing cities disproportionately, considering the giant subsidy that they got from the vaccines. Remember, these corporations were essentially given welfare by being able to be the distributors of these vaccines that draws people into the stores. And yet at the same time, there's a giant reduction in the number of storefronts in these areas. So you would think in places I'm where sure they COVID actually had, had higher... nothing to do with uh, with the, the closure of those stores. Well, COVID, COVID actually had everything to do with the boost in business because these were... Would stores be cl would large employers be closing because of COVID? I feel like the PPP and I think mean, there's a lot of stimulus given to big businesses. I mean, like it was really given to everybody, but big businesses since they capture more of the employment economy are going to be getting more. But I, it's possible. I don't know actually. I feel like smaller businesses are the ones that got fucked harder by the COVID shit than any of the larger corporations. But I could be wrong on that. <clears throat> For the distributors of the vaccine. No, I understand they were to distribute the vaccine, but you're also aware that, like, you know, uh, people's uh, uh, purchasing uh, patterns uh, changed dramatically during COVID. There's a lot of, like, uh, restaurants that uh, closed. There's a lot of... Yeah, I mean, of, they uh, closed to restaurants, okay. and if you weren't able to ship to delivery, you were pretty All much right. screwed And over. so, um, uh, you, you think we need to stigmatize... Um, uh, criminals, for sure, 100%. Criminals more, and that will uh, do it. And... How do you think we how do you think we stigmatize criminals like what what part of society like we know that there's and, and you don't believe do you believe there's a correlation between poverty and extreme poverty uh with with crime yes i i know for a fact that crime drives poverty in the united states of america and the world over okay. so yes there's a, there is a correlation uh do you think that there is no wait why would sean say that I don't think Sam even realized what Sean just said. Sam is trying to make the argument that poverty drives crime. Sean just countered saying crime drives poverty. I don't think Sam realized he just gave like the total inverse of his. Does he not realize or? There's a correlation between uh, that the poverty drives crime. Yes. I'm no, Sean, no, you just made the exact opposite point. I don't even think you believe that poverty. I think Sean believes that crime causes poverty, not that poverty causes crime. Relation between uh, that the poverty drives crime. Yes. I'm sorry, okay. crime drives poverty. Yes. Okay, yeah. sorry, he corrected himself. Yeah. Okay. I'm asking you specifically. I know that you. How does that make sense? Um, Sean probably believes that the more crime that occurs in an area, the more that it d basically fits an area up, and then it more drives um, crime in an area. Or, or drives poverty, poverty as a result, that crime destroys areas. That's probably the argument that he's going to make. You, you're, you're arguing that you think crime creates poverty. But I'm asking you now, do you think that poverty creates crime? 
I think in certain circumstances, I'm sure it could happen if you go down to a certain level for sure. But I think that in that order mean, to if build, you go down to a certain level, what is yeah? That if mean? you're like, well, we have like um, well, actually, even that is is a bit of a dubious notion. So like American poverty, like you would acknowledge, is relative poverty compared to poverty in like the third world. I mean, e like you understand that somebody in the United States of America in poverty would be under twelve thousand dollars which would be different from somebody who's living on a dollar fifty a day like well, under you understand 12, that, that poverty is really a function of purchasing power right sure purchasing power could have an impact i mean that's i mean that's yeah we all all, all poverty measures yeah, are yeah a function for, of, uh, you of, can, of you can. while that is true it's not like in places where people live for less than a dollar a day it's like oh yeah like here's my you know, here's my $14 a month apartment. I've got a 50 cent a month internet connection. I bought an iPhone for $20. I, like these people are poor, both in relative purchasing power um, forms and in absolute poverty forms. Like they're just poor. <laughs> like brokies in the third world are not the same as brokies in America, right? There's a reason why middle-class people in some countries can be like starving and homeless people in the United States are obese, right? There's a difference in the types of poverty that we experience. That's an easy bullet to bite. You can State, adjust right? it for, yeah, sure. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, if you had no stores, there would be no, uh, uh, there'd be no theft of stuff in there and that's not really relevant, but okay, yes. I understand if that, you yes. Typically need if a you are in living in America and you are poor, uh, theoretically, um, well, you, you have a access to more stuff than, let's say, you live somewhere else. Yes. There, there yeah. you go. Okay. 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 All right. And? Yeah, so you're talking about relative poverty. So I'm saying at a certain amount, yes, when there's like genuine desperation, like I could see circumstances where that's happening. But what we typically see is that crime is driving the poverty. Like when these people steal from their areas, when they what damage places. What do you think places. drives crime? What I think drives, I think people, people, a certain percentage of the population is going to be criminal. They need to be removed from society. So I would say human nature would be a, would be a good example. Human nature? Yeah, it's okay. a small percentage of the population that exhibits like a deviant kind of behavior. Okay, so what do you think drives the majority of crime? I just said that. Oh, you, you think it's just people who are born criminals? I wouldn't say born criminals, but people who, when you don't have the proper deterrence in place, will commit crimes, yes. And those deterrence could be police I, I, deterrence, like I said earlier, okay, okay, or wait, 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 social wait, wait, deterrence, but, but, or whatever. But not, like, everybody is subject to the same deterrence, right? Uh, not necessarily. W w explain this. Because I'll give you, I, I, so, so I'll give you an example. So in New York City, disproportionately, the people who live in public housing happen to be Orthodox Jewish people, right? They do not commit crimes at the same rates as other demographics. They're in fact among the lowest. They commit crimes near around where Asians do. So they're probably better than your average middle class uh -oh. white person Sam's in the city about to of New York. Push them. Oh, I no. think that they have a stronger social structure than other groups uh -oh. in the United States of America, even if they're equivalent in poverty levels. So if I was to look at like the incarceration rates of black people, for instance, sure. relative to white people, your argument would be that there's something fundamental about their social structure that is uh, that is uh, why that we, we see those incarceration rates higher. Well, it would be based on their behavior for the one to one. But if you're asking me for like an underlying cause to the behavior, which, by the way, I don't care about because root causes are not more important than any other cause. Let's be clear about that. So this is just like another rabbit hole, pointless like argument that has nothing to do with the subject matter. In my opinion, it's not useful or productive. But yeah, I would say that there is there are definite cultural differences between uh, what were the groups that you said black americans and white americans uh yeah yeah between there's definitely cultural differences between black americans and white americans and more tolerance to criminality to, and by the way there's differences between black new yorkers and black people in chicago and that's also reflected in the rates and i think that does lead to different outcomes in terms of criminal justice and you think it's unrelated to um, uh, things like uh, poverty or systemic racism or... Well, if uh, we have... 
So if we're going to use poverty as the metric and we compare poor black Americans to poor Asians or poor Hispanics and what by drives the way, crime people wanting to steal and not pay for on it. average, but Duh. less than black These people Americans. are so disingenuous then, and think every criminal is just a broke man feeding his family. I'm cringing hard. Wow. Obviously, poverty is not the determining factor if the crime rates vary wildly. Well, I have an analogy for you. Uh -oh. um, when you build in a house, and you have different, uh, um, uh, you have different uh, uh, foundations, and you pull one out. So, I mean, poverty yeah, I think may not be the interval... determinant, but maybe when you mix poverty with other sort of like structural factors in society, peoples have less reason to uh, feel a, a stigma about crime or less reason. To be invested in society, do you, but like, you don't. Subscribe can you, can to you give an example? Can I give an example? Yeah, of, of this other factor. Well, I mean, I think that like, um, if you have been stuck in extreme poverty for extended periods of time, if you live in a society where it is harder for you to uh, uh, to find housing or loans or to get out of a specific area in which you're living. Um, if you have been subjected to um, a, a, uh, a socialization that labels you as a criminal uh, or that your activity just walking around is criminal, that it might create Who's that. Who's being arrested for walking around? Uh-oh. Well, not arrested, but harassed. I mean, I think you, you wouldn't deny. I mean, your argument would be there's more violent crime in certain areas, and that's why there's more cops. But we also know that, I mean, if, if you're a black teen and you're walking uh, the the streets in some neighborhoods, uh, you are far more likely to get uh, stopped and harassed uh, by the cops. I don't think this makes you more likely to commit crime, though, does it? Like a black guy is like, God, the cops have profiled me so much. Well, I'm gonna go give them something to profile me about. Like, so then if you're a white, I wouldn't team, say harassment. You are more likely. We know to what interact kind of people police. are committing these crimes. Let the hate flow through you. Yes, okay. there's more police there. I, I mean, I think from the perspective of that person uh, who is interacting with the police after having done nothing, they would perceive it as harassment. For you sure. If, if, I was, if I was a law-abiding person in a black neighborhood and I had to interact with the police due to the fact that, you know, criminals are acting up in my neighborhood, then that would get under my skin. I mean, I have... What if you were, like, pulled over uh, in, like, your car? I mean, I, uh, I've i told this story on the show many times, but I was an actor uh, uh, back in the day. And Man, uh, still an actor, buddy. Just because of the strike doesn't mean that they're not going to resolve that. No, that's true. I do do some voice work, but uh, never... <laughs> you didn't get that joke at all. <laughs> Bless. I, would, uh, I was on a sitcom at one point, and um, uh, it was... Uh, a majority black cast and uh one of the buddies was uh we went back to his uh, place and we we pull in uh into the uh underground driveway uh parking lot and a buddy of his pulls in behind us and he's got one of those uh, range rovers and at that time that was a very popular car uh in uh, la with like uh the hollywood set and uh, this is back in the 90s and he pulls in, he's like, thank God you're here. I just got, uh, uh, I was getting followed again by the cops. I've been pulled over four times in the past two months. Uh, and uh, they checked to see if I own the car. And I called the uh, police department to see if I could get a sticker or something. And the, he said, the sergeant literally said, are you black? And I said, yes. And he said, there's nothing I can do. Now, <sighs> Man, I really don't want to discount people's stories, but that sounds a little sussy, sussy baka, but okay. Now, if you're a law-abiding citizen and you're driving the car that you earned to, and you bought the car and you're getting that type of harassment, you don't think it impacts your perspective on society? No, I think it does. And, uh, but does it make Los you Angeles commit crime? In time period? It was in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's obviously, oh, you know... There, but I, but I you think, just exceeded to me that uh, conceded yeah, to me no, that, I that think, this I think happens that to 17-year-old boy, uh, uh, boys uh, in New I mean, you could call me City. crazy, but I don't think you're saying... 90s LA, that's believable. Never mind. <laughs> I believe it. ...saying that your friend turned into a criminal because he was pulled over. Oh, there you go. Like, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's not going to turn you into a criminal, I don't think. Now it sounds like, well, actually, my friend wanted to be a very prolific... ...a prolific bank robber. 
he was really annoyed. I which think I, if I, I think if I think if, if I, I think if that happened to me, and I didn't have a nice car, but rather I just got stopped every time I, I I walk out of my house or stopped. I don't know once a month every time I'm out of my house, which is not then, hard then to you'd find. Then start committing rapes. Oh no, AJ, you should have let him finish. He should have let him finish. I'm so curious. Sam was about to say some dumb shit. Like I don't, I don't. No, I would start uh, having a far less uh, um, respect for society, and yeah, but that's not going to make less, you commit crimes. Uh, 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 a perspective on that, yeah, I definitely think that. I mean, I mean I look, I, 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 I'm, rape, I've, but I, I understand you don't watch my my uh, like you don't watch any of my videos or anything like that. But I correct. said repeatedly, I think the warning needs to be brought back in terms of policing. I think writing tickets for expired registration when you're in areas with elevated rates of shootings. All that does is piss people off and turn the community against you. So there's definitely better ways to implement policy to get the community on your side. Like I've been a huge advocate for consent searches, which is if, and this started in St. Louis in the nineties, which is if you're afraid that your kid is involved in a gang or might have a gun or might get shot, they have a high rate of youth homicides, still high to this very day, then you can call the police consent to a search They'll look for contraband, but they won't arrest your kid. I think that, and they'll send your kid to a diversion program before they get into a shooting and all that. So I think that is a good policy to build community relations with the police. Like the way that you're speaking is as if I don't believe in that, even though I think that's absolutely crucial to the police being effective. Okay. All right. Well, I think this was uh, was uh, productive, Sean. All right. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, it, uh, uh, I, are you are you happy? He basically yeah, said the thank debate. You. Sam said good faith indicator. Thank you for having the conversation. Listen, I know you want people that have been ducking you and all that, and uh, this is what prompted me to just ask for the conversation. I appreciate oh, it. Oh yeah, no, I say yes to just about everybody. Uh, maybe too much, but yeah, I, and I you do. didn't and you didn't have to do it. Like I, a lot of people immediately presumed because I issued the challenge and like they didn't hear a like direct announcement on a billboard or something that like i was somehow entitled to it i obviously not entitled to it i thank you for your time you've been quite gracious during the course of this conversation even if there were parts where i felt like you were trying to get you get me on a gotcha but thank you for your time well i mean uh i i was just ex exploring i don't know what you mean by a gotcha i've never seen any of the the, the other stuff you've done but okay uh, I appreciate that. Actually, I got a question for you. If we're going to do a gotcha, uh -oh. sure you're thing. into criminal justice, right? Uh, sure. Or to you don't like the criminal part, actual justice, right? You don't like the adjective beforehand. What did you think when when uh, and and I I will concede I did not see the 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 whole Tim Pool interview uh, with you guys with you and Emma. Did you think that she was a pedophile after that no, uh, conversation? No. So do you did you see that when Tim accused her of being a pedophile from what was said in that conversation? I, I didn't see that specific clip, but I, I have heard about it. And if he said like she's a pedophile or whatever, then that's totally uncalled for and unprompted. Jesus Christ! Yeah, that's what I thought. That sounded weird yeah. to me. But I, I appreciate I like, you you're saying I, that. I appreciated Tim having me on, but I don't like I'm not an employee of his or anything like that. Even though on the later show I said I moved into his property. I did not see that, but uh, have fun there. I heard he's got a great skate park. I, right, he John. does. <laughs> it's, it's a, I'm not a skateboarder, but it's a skateboarder's paradise, you know, presumably.